Okay, so let's start today's online seminar. So um, today we will have Professor Daniel Green from UC San Diego, and he will be talking about his recent paper with title, No News, No Neutrinos is Good News. So please start when you're ready. Okay, well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, please uh, ask questions. I've tried to give a broad back, like a fair amount of background. Um, so that everyone's on the same page. But if something's confusing and not clear, please let me know. Um, okay, so um, this the plan for the talk is I'm going to kind of go over these two this paper that came out about a month ago with Nathaniel Craig, Joel Myers, and Sajit Rajendran, and I'll also include some results that are to appear hopefully very soon. Um, follow up work with with Joel Myers. Okay, so here's the outline. So first I'm going to review what we know about the cosmic neutrino background and why it's interesting. Um, then we'll talk about the measurement of neutrino mass in cosmology. Um, and then we'll talk about recent data that may hint at negative neutrino mass or zero neutrino mass um, and, um, and what that means for uh, beyond the standard model physics. Okay, so cosmic neutrinos. So when cosmologists talk about the history of the universe, they usually show a picture like this. It always looks the same. It starts with inflation, usually we're heating up to some high temperature. We might have dark matter. Um, we have neutrinos and evolution of the universe till today. But uh, when you talk to particle physicists, they usually show you pictures that look like this, as in there's all kinds of histories of the universe that might be interesting. Um, they might have different scales of inflation to be much higher or lower than the cosmologists might be interested in. They might have phase transitions or particle production of all kinds. Um, and the reason for this distinction is because cosmology plays such an important role in the problems that are of interest to particle physicists. So, um, for example, obviously there are things like the cosmological constant problem, the origin of dark matter, the possibility of dark sectors, but also things like the strong CP problem that a priori have no cosmological um, origin of the problem itself, but solutions may be found through changing cosmological history. The same has been true of some recent attempts to solve the hierarchy problem. And of course, the long pattern of introducing new symmetries to explain the patterns of physics also have typically shown up with cosmological signatures, often in the form of new particles that might be thermally produced. And that's not even mentioning the long list of obviously cosmological problems that we were interested in, such as the origin of structure, the origin of baryons, magnetic fields, and so on and so forth. So cosmological data for this reason has the potential to tell us about the history of the universe. It's obviously sensitive to the history of the universe and can inform questions about beyond the standard model physics. So this includes uh, things like the CMB, but uh, lensing of the CMB, other signals that we infer from the maps of in the microwave, and also of course maps of the distribution of matter and galaxies in say angle and redshift on the sky. So all these different maps have the potential to inform how we think about beyond the center model physics. Now one way we I often look at the just the broad potential of cosmology to inform how we think about um, about BSM physics is through say the plot of just dark sector um, scenarios and how we might be sensitive to them via the cosmic microwave background. So here's just our plot of mass um, and various scenarios that involve the cosmic microwave background signatures that show up in a variety of ways, either the primary CMB, through other CMB signals, depending on the couplings. But we see that there's a huge range of mass, 45 more orders of magnitude shown in this plot and a whole wide variety of different things to look for. This should be compared to plots you may have seen in the context of small scale dark matter experiments or axion experiments in this case, but other kinds of experiments where we also cover a wide range of dark matter mass and a wide variety of signals and experiments that could go after them. And so in this regard, the single experiment in cosmology has a lot of potential to inform us about a, lot, a wide variety of possible signals in beyond the standard model physics. So what is the advantage of cosmology in a world with all kinds of 
uh, lab-based experiments. Well, just on the, the merits, cosmology is more sensitive in a certain concrete way than the lab has been, um, particularly with regards to dark sectors. So, for example, we measure the abundance of dark matter at 120 sigma, of course, and then we also have measured the existence of the cosmic neutrino background at 30 sigma, and we've seen neither one of them directly in the lab. So the origin of this superior sensitivity is really based on two key things. The first is that cosmic observables get their origin at very high temperatures and hence also very high densities. So there are situations in the early universe that were indirectly probing through cosmology where the number densities are much higher than something we could create in the lab or even in some cases astrophysically. The second key advantage is that we're able to use that high number density to make a gravitational measurement of the dynamic, the contents of the universe. So we know about the existence of neutrinos and dark matter through their gravitational influence, and we don't depend on an additional coupling to the standard model. Um, we're just using the one guaranteed way in which it can communicate with the standard model. So in this previous plot, for example, you know, a huge fraction of what we're looking for is just gravitational signals that show up in different ways as different uh, different changes to the CMB, but fundamentally those changes arise from purely gravitational interactions. So once we have those high net number densities of particles, then we're just looking for gravity. And that's a thing that we can't, we don't have to worry about whether it's there or not. It's guaranteed once the number density is there. Okay, so with that sort of broad motivation, the purpose of today's talk is really to focus on cosmic neutrinos, but of course we'll come back to this broader picture of all of the different ways that BSM physics affects the CMB. Um, so we're gonna, the, the cosmic neutrino background is formed um, about one second after the Big Bang, and it generally is free streams to us and is a probe of the universe at that time. The cosmic neutrinos are formed um, at the high temperatures of the early universe. They're produced through the weak interactions. So just on dimensional analysis, you can guess that the production rate goes like G Fermi squared and hence goes like temperature to the fifth. And so at high temperatures, temperature to the fifth wins over the expansion rate that goes like temperature squared and then in, per, per, into thermal equilibrium. And of course, as the temperature cools, temperature to the fifth uh, decreases much faster than T squared. And so eventually they fall out of equilibrium. And by dimensional analysis, that happens around one MeV, which is a pretty good approximation to what has been observed. Now, significantly, one MeV is above the mass of the electron. And so this is important because the neutrinos decouple before the entropy that is in electron positron pairs is converted into the entropy of photons once you drop below the temperature of the, the associated with the mass of the electron and they become Boltzmann suppressed. So as the universe cools after neutrino decoupling, the photons are heated relative to the neutrinos and you get this ratio of the temperatures that's related by this famous 11 force factor. Now cosmologists and particle physicists often choose to represent this information in terms of a number called N effective which is basically just a measurement of the energy density in neutrinos multiplied by a bunch of constants so that N effective would be three if the neutrinos perfectly decoupled at a temperature of, of a few MeV um, and assuming it was just a non-interacting uh, dilute gas. Now, of course, neither of these approximations is perfect. Um, there's still some finite rate of neutrino production from electron positron annihilation the plasma involves QED corrections. And so the true value of N effective in the standard model is known to be about three, but, but modified at about one and a half percent um, with a correction that has been calculated to increasing precision over the past few years. Uh, so can I have a question? Yep. So this N effective measurement actually measures the ratio of the rho nu over rho gamma, right? Um, so, <laughs> What it measures, I mean, it measures, you can think of it that way given, I mean, we know rho gamma so well that to make that distinction is kind of not necessarily important. Um, well, I'm gonna explain where the measurement comes from in cosmology, and then we can talk about what it's actually measuring. But, but um, 
N effective is defined relative to, to, to photons. That is, that's true. But if we distorted the photons, we could probably also find that it would look like a distortion and effective. Um, it would be hard, like, but we could talk about the, we could talk about whether there's a way to do that in unison. Um, that that's related to this sort of scaling symmetry that people talk about. So the, so for our purposes, yes, let's just fix the total density photons based on knowledge of the temperature. And then it's relative to that. Um, if, but that's that's fine if you want to think about it that way for the purpose of this talk. Does that does that is that okay? Yeah, sure. Thanks. I think I think in the context of BBN, it's important to distinguish whether that's really true or not. But for our purposes here, it's fine to think of it as just the ratio. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, that was a little convoluted, but but yes, it's it's not always clear what's being held fixed and what's varying in cosmology. So it's always care important to think about it. Um, but but yes, it, it won't matter for us. The ratio is fine. Okay, so now the key way we currently understand the cosmic neutrino background is through the the CMB, which is the um, which is of course the same story as told through photons. So um, it's a relic light from redshift of about a thousand or eleven hundred, more accurately. Um, that is that's left over from when neutral hydrogen formed. So before that, the photons were scattering off of the free electrons uh, at a redshift of about 1,000 or 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Electrons get bound in protons. The photons no longer scatter off of them and they just free stream towards us. Now, right before the neutral, the, the, um, the electrons become bound in hydrogen, the photons, electrons, and protons all formed a relativistic fluid um, because they're all bouncing off of each other. So the uh, photons are banging off the electrons and then the electrons are bound, are interacting with the protons through the Coulomb force. And the neutrinos have long since decoupled, they decoupled at a second. They're just floating along, along with the dark matter, all coupled via gravity. When we look at the cosmic wave background, what we're seeing are the sound waves that are propagating through that fluid. So we have a fluid, it has sound waves. These sound waves are compression modes, so they have hot and cold spots as, the, as they oscillate from high to low density. And that's, we're seeing a snapshot of those sound waves at 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Oh, what happened? Okay, now when we look at the power spectrum of the CMB, which is basically to take all of those sound waves and decompose them in spherical harmonics, this pattern of acoustic peaks is adding up different Fourier modes that have the same wavelength. And what we find is that they add coherently so that this pattern of peaks and troughs is representing a cosine, a pure cosine of sound waves. Now that's very important because at this time, again, note we have this, we have the wave equation, it's coupled to gravity, but what we're seeing is that there's no sine component. So it's a pure cosine, okay? Now this, traces its origin to the fact that density fluctuations were produced during inflation. So if, if the density fluctuations were produced long before recombination, then just by the expansion of the universe, we had two long wavelength solutions, um, and one of them will redshift to zero, and the other one will become a constant. Those are just the two long wavelength solutions before, so when they start out, wavelengths much bigger than the horizon, they shrink down and start looking like sound waves. And because one of the solutions is small because of the expansion of the universe, you're, you don't have a phase left over. There's just one, everything's in phase. And so it turns out that because of that expansion, you're left just with a cosine, the sine wave goes away, and the amplitude, which is random, is produced in a time long before, and that's what we call inflation. And then of course, the physics of all of the stuff after inflation is encoded in this cosine and slight variations thereof in co in, that encode all of the physics after recombination. Importantly, because the random amplitude and the cosine are just totally separated, they factorize, that's how we measure this nice table of numbers. We can learn all about inflation and all about the post recombination universe because they're separated into two different things. We have inflation, which has the amplitudes and all of the coherent stuff that is non-random is determined by the late universe. Now in this picture of sound waves, this is where we, why we can measure the cosmic neutrino background. 
So specifically, as you go to higher and higher multiples in the CMB, so you go to higher and higher L, these are sound waves that started oscillating earlier in the history of the universe. And so these sound waves over here are increasingly during the radiation domination era. And even though neutrino temperature is suppressed compared to the photon temperature, it's not that suppressed. The neutrinos make up 41% of the total energy density in the universe during radiation domination, which means that any gravitational effect that is relevant to the evolution of the modes at high L gets 41% of its contribution from the cosmic neutrino background. So the first such effect is just the influence on the total expansion rate. So 41% of the expansion rate squared is determined by the cosmic neutrino background. One way this shows up is through the suppression of the high L modes, which is caused by diffusion. So basically the photons are random walking inside of a little over density, and eventually the randoms walk their way out. And that's what causes the, the sound waves to sort of dissipate is that random walking process. Random walks go like the square root of time or the distance goes like T. And so how much diffusion occurs is a direct measurement of how much time there was. And the only time scale in the problem is Hubble. And so what we find is that the amount of neutrinos in the universe affects this damping down. So that is the main effect that's responsible for how we measure the energy density of neutrinos. It gives rise to this sort of our standard open Planck 2018 cosmic parameters. And you read off a number like this. It's consistent with three to about 5% accuracy. And so using this knowledge, you can then go and constrain all kinds of beyond the standard model physics. And, um, and it's getting increasingly interesting as a window into um, new particles that could have added to N effective. However, for our purposes, which was we really want to make sure we have neutrinos to start, we can go deeper and ask, are we really sure there's just neutrinos? And so we can go back to this picture of what we're looking at. We're looking at sound waves coupled to neutrinos, which don't aren't just, they're just free streaming and dark matter. And we can just talk about the speeds at which you're propagating. So we have the sound wave that, that's propagating at about a square root of three of, of the speed of light. We have neutrinos, which are free streaming, so they're traveling at the speed of light. And we have dark matter, which is super cold and boring, and it's just sitting still and not going anywhere. So now, if you want to think of the dynamics of this system um, in the early universe, we can think of like dropping a rock in a pond and watching the waves go out. But that rock is being dropped into the plasma that is the, is the CMB. The dark matter gets a big spike and doesn't go anywhere because it has no velocity. The sound waves propagate out in a ring. And the neutrinos propagate out in kind of a, like just a haze. But part of that travels at the speed of light ahead of the sound waves. And because it's traveling ahead of the sound waves, it produces a perturbation through gravity that's traveling supersonically. And that shows up as regenerating the sign that was missing because of, that was previously not there because of uh, inflation. And so one way to think of the sign is as a phase shift. So the sign is a, yep, question? Yeah, question. So um, you said that this uh, a neutrino propagates in the speed of light, which is much faster than the sound speed. But uh, um, why then is the sign term in the bottom right is still written as sound speed CS? Um, so because what it does is that the neutrinos eventually are gone, and all they have done is perturbed the fluid. So what happens is that, so think of it, think of it as this happens. There's a brief period of time before the neutrinos have totally diffused and gone away again, where it's a source gravitationally for waves. But once the source is gone, the solutions still have to take the form of the solutions to a wave equation, which are sines and cosines. So it always goes back to a solution to the wave equation, just the coefficients are changed. So the amplitude has changed and the sign component is now changed. But once the neutrinos have kind of done their thing and evolved out, we're back to a solution of the wave equation. It just now it has this extra piece that looks acausal. Does that make Thanks. sense? Yes. Thanks. Can I have one more question? Hi, Daniel. There's one more question? Yeah, so I think you're comparing two different quantities, right? This speed of light is the speed that you neutrino particles propagate. Then you're comparing that with the sound speed of photon fluid. But then neutrino fluid, when it's relativistic, must propagate at 
same C over C of the three, right? So, but neutrinos are not a fluid. They're just free streaming. And so they do travel at the speed of light. If you want, if one way to think of it is you try to write the neutrinos as a fluid, you will find that the higher multiple moments are not, you can't throw them away. And so this, so one way that people talk about this is they say the way that this shows up is that the anisotropic stress of the neutrinos shows up in this equation, which is a term that's usually zero if it was a fluid. But that's just, the anisotropic stress is just doing the job of showing that the neutrinos are really traveling at the speed of light. So you can trace it through however you like, but there is a solution to the equations of motion that has that travels at the speed of the light, at speed of light. But you, the only way to see that is to keep keep all the multiple moments. You can't treat the neutrinos like a fluid. Okay, good. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, so one can go and and check this. And you find indeed that like if you just put in a general fluid thing that's traveling at the sound speed, it has this um, this pattern, which until it's traveling faster than the sound speed, there's no phase shift. As in the sine is the same as adding a phase to the cosine, this phase becomes non-zero when it's traveling faster. And you can also just go and check in the CMB. You can remove this damping effect and you can remove the change to the amplitude and you'll be left with this phase shift um, and this phase shift indeed is the, this is the motion that's precisely, you can check that it agrees with what you would expect from this theoretical description in terms of a mode traveling faster than the speed of sound. And then you can go look for it. This is a template you can go look for in the data. It was looked for in temperature and found um, here at about five sigma, just with temperature. With temperature plus polarization, it's been found at about 10 sigma. And so you see that you not only are you measuring that the neutrinos are there through the contribution of their energy density, but they're there as a component that travels faster than the sound speed and is doing something that has a very specific prediction. Um, um, in the interest of time, I'll just kind of flash that this same effect then survives in the distribution of galaxies. The galaxies also have this kind of leftover wiggle that has to do with these sound waves. That wiggle has the same effect. It gets a phase shift due to neutrinos, and that phase shift has been seen in about 99.5% confidence. So putting it all together, this is where we're at. Um, we, just from the CMB, you see the cosmic neutrino background at about 20 sigma. If you add BBN data, it's 30 sigma. If you just focus on the phase shift of the CMB, it's about 10 sigma. If you, then you can even look just in this baryon acoustic oscillation part of the galaxy distribution, that's three sigma. The last two, these phase shifts are not mimicked by any other physics of the lambda CDM model. So no, even nonlinear physics doesn't affect this, this phase shift. And therefore we've seen in a very concrete way, a lot of evidence that the cosmic neutrino background is there and is behaving kind of like you would expect. Okay, so, so that's just where we are with N effective. Uh, I'm gonna now move on to massive neutrinos. Is that, that okay? So, Hi. Any questions? Yeah. Danielle, this is Vicky Dong. Uh, I'm hosting class. Uh, just the question about the, you said it's uh, not mimicked by any other components, but there are in the Florian's paper about the primordial feature showing up like the, the phase shift in the PAO as a function of K. So such a feature can, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, okay, so primordial, so I've thought a lot about primordial features. So the key thing is primordial features. Um, so, so I did say lambda CDM, so you could worry about, so the primordial features are, let's say beyond lambda CDM, which just has NS in the power spectrum. But the key distinction with primordial features is that the amplitude of the effect will be much bigger in large scale structure than in the CMB. And so even if you introduce a primordial feature to cause the phase shift of the CMB, it would have an effect that's already excluded by the large scale structure because you put the feature into the dark matter. So it's just a way, like if you just look at this plot, right? Like this plot here is a 5% oscillation. Whereas this plot here is an order one oscillation. And so if you put it into the primordial statistics, you have to put an order one phase shift into the CMB, which would be an order one effect on dark matter. 
and that's not seen. And so to be consistent to only affect the baryons is actually a non-trivial requirement unless you're gonna put a primordial feature plus some kind of isocurvature perturbation or something. But those are also constrained and not easy to, to get away with. But it's really not, the primordial features are pretty distinct. Does it, it, I'm not sure, does that answer the question? I think so, it's interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. I really, I've, I thought I was gonna go very fast through this from my previous practice. So we'll see how, uh, we'll see how this goes. I'll uh, get back on speed. So, okay, so everyone in this audience presumably knows neutrinos have mass. Um, they were detected on earth um, via neutrino oscillations, um, atmospheric and solar neutrinos. The atmospheric and solar neutrinos tell us the, um, the splittings of the eigenvalues now, that's what, not what matters for cosmology. For cosmology, the main thing that matters is the total sum of all the masses. And the reason being that, again, in cosmology, we see things gravitationally. And so what's going to matter to us is that when neutrinos become non-relativistic, their energy density scales basically like the number density times the mass. And so you just add up all the masses because they all kind of look the same. Now, that's important because we basically get to add up all the neutrino mass eigenvalues. And so because we know there are splittings, this, depending on whether it's a normal or inverted hierarchy, we have a minimum neutrino mass sum of either 58 or 100 milli EV, which basically is the difference of those two things is whether two of the eigenvalues are heavy or only one is heavy. But this sets a lower bound for what we expect the mass to be, given what we know about the history of the universe and what we know about neutrinos. Now, we also know that this mass can't be too large because as we already saw, we see neutrinos traveling pretty fast around recombination. And so if they were already non-relativistic by at a redshift of a thousand, they wouldn't produce this phase shift. And that's basically what people are seeing when they put bounds just using the primary CMB. So if you the temperature of the CMB is about uh, 0.25 EV, and the bounds from Planck on the sum of neutrino masses using only the primary CMB is about the same number. And that's basically the statement that we know that at recombination, neutrinos were still basically relativistic. However, because the temperature continues to drop by looking at data that comes from lower redshifts, we can try to look at this non-relativistic effects, which highlight the mass. Now the challenge though, so neutrinos, the first approximation are some component of the matter, at least homo as a hom homogeneous contribution, but they're a very small component of the matter. So if we look at the fraction of the late universe energy density in non-relative neutrinos, it's basically half a percent times the sum of the neutrino mass over this minimum value of 58 milliEV. Okay, so for most observables in cosmology, you would expect the contribution goes like the, if there's something that depends on the fact it's neutrinos, it'll be the fraction of energy in neutrinos times some order one number, whatever the effect is. And that's roughly true. So if you try to measure omega matter at late times to try to figure out how much of that came from the neutrinos, you would have to measure omega matter at one part, at, you know, a few parts in a thousand. And most of those measurements are not that accurate. They're more like 1% measurements. However, there's one place where the neutrinos have a bigger effect, and that's in structure formation. So we know that neutrinos suppress the formation of structure. So a universe without neutrinos will have more nonlinear structure, larger structure, more structure formation than a universe with massive neutrinos. The reason for that is that while neutrinos are non-relativistic at low redshift, they're not that non-relativistic. So in particular, even at redshift of zero, their velocity is still about 1% of the speed of light, which is still too fast for them to be, to, for them to fall into the gravitational wells formed by dark matter. So the dark matter wants to form clumps and the neutrinos basically don't wanna have it unless we're talking about enormous scales. And so what happens is that the, um, the neutrinos see an effective gene scale. So some scale we'll call K free streaming on scales much, so on 
Fourier modes much smaller than that, or in physical scales much larger than that, the neutrinos cluster, but on smaller wavelengths or higher Fourier uh, wave numbers, we see those things just don't collapse anymore. They just freeze out and they just, they don't like to collapse. Now you can, this is all encoded in the linear evolution. So if you just want to say, I take a continuity equation and a momentum conservation equation, I just plug everything in, then the place that that shows up is through this, you adding a pressure term or a speed of sound term for the neutrinos. So you can just add that to your equation. And you'll find just following through that equation, you get a term that looks like a gene scale. It's related to the speed of propagation like so, and you can plug in all the numbers for what you expect the temperature to be, et cetera. And at redshift of zero, you find this scale here, which is a pretty small scale. The second thing you'll do define by solving these equations is that the rate of growth, even on the scales where the neutrinos don't cluster at all. So you'll find that there's a solution that just wants to go to zero at high K from the neutrinos. The dark matter continues to grow. It wants to collapse and form uh, structure. But the rate at which it forms structure is actually smaller. It's suppressed by the formation by the neutrinos. Basically, neutrinos are doing a job of counteracting gravity because some of the energy density just wants to go out. And it's stopping the other matter around from really forming structure. So as a result, it does it, it both doesn't cluster, but it also prevents the formation of structure. It prevents other structures from forming, even if the neutrinos are not participating. So how this shows up in the matter power spectrum is first that, that you basically just remove them from the total energy density. So if you're looking at like the fractional overdensities, you just remove the fraction of energy that's in neutrinos because you think this is all of the matter, but actually they're just not part of that matter that clusters. But this, so this on its own would not be a very big effect. You'd say this two times uh, one part, you know, four times 10 to the minus three is sort of a less than 1% effect. But the second term, this effect on the growth of structure is built up from the time the neutrinos become non-relativistic to today. So that enhances how much they suppress structure by a significant amount. So specifically, here's what you get. So this, these are lines corresponding to, to um, just running CAM. I'm looking at the matter power spectrum. And you see that the effect even for, for the minimum sum is about 3% suppression. Now, this analytic model is just the one where I took the free streaming scale and just put it in as like a step function, like this free streaming scale is independent of time, which it is not, it evolves with time. Um, this line here is just taking the linear equations and solving them numerically. So what you see here is that the evolution of, you know, using CAM gets basically exactly just capturing this fact that there's a speed of sound in the linear evolution, which is introducing something that looks like a gene scale. And altogether, adding up all those effects leads to an almost factor of 10 additional suppression of the matter power spectrum. So this factor of 10 is what takes an effect that's less than 1% and turns it into something that's a few percent and making it possible to detect. Now we can go and look, is there a question? Oh yeah, can I have a question? Yeah. So yeah, on the graph in the last slide. Yeah. So um, why is the in initial value of the uh, vertical axis is different for the three cases? Oh, so this has to do with like what you're holding fixed. So when you run CAM, you can't just change neutrino mass holding everything else fixed. Like you have to like, so it's whether you're holding omega matter fixed, which just is basically boiling down to some, this is like almost pure gauge because it's like at the wavelength of the entire universe. So this normalization you shouldn't think of as too significant because it's just balancing the budget of what you're calling the total uh, long wavelength fluctuation. Um, so that's why like the, getting this exactly right between all of them, because here I'm solving the equation, like just, I can solve the equation mode by mode, changing F new holding everything else fixed, but that's not how these Boltzmann codes work. Does that make sense? I see, yeah, thanks. Okay, so now we wanna go out and we wanna find an observable that's gonna see the suppression. Um, there's a bunch of candidates in the late universe looking at like 
galaxy clustering or looking at number counts of galaxies, those tend to be probes of very nonlinear modes. So even if you're looking for a suppression, it's a suppression in a regime that's sort of on small physical scales where there's a lot going on. You're talking about clusters, et cetera. The, the, uh, the observable that's really clean is CMB lensing. CMB lensing sees this effect of neutrinos, but the CMB lensing kernel really lives at very large physical scales away from the nonlinear scale and at very high redshifts far away from nonlinear evolution. So this is what we're talking about. We're looking at the cosmic microwave background. Its path is distorted by the matter between us and the cosmic microwave background. And from the, from the distortion it has on the primary CMB, we can reconstruct the lenses and make maps of the lensing potential like the one shown here from Planck. Now, the problem with this is that while there's this free streaming scale, the reality is that the error bars are generally too big to resolve this free streaming scale. And all you're really talking about is an overall amplitude of, len of, of the lensing potential. So you don't see this shape, you just see the offset between this line, which is what you would have expected in a universe without neutrinos, and, um, and the one that you see in your actual lensing potential. And because of that, it tends to be that you don't gain very much information by where you have this because you're just measuring this overall suppression. And the limitations of that are kind of, we'll talk about in a second, are not driven by statistics. And so if you cut your data at various points, you find that you get the same result. And so in that regard, I just well, I want to emphasize that while we're measuring CMB lensing, and CMB lensing has a lot of scales involved, really as far as neutrino mass goes, it's just one number that really matters. It's just this overall amplitude, all of the shape and what it's doing don't affect our ability to measure neutrino mass. So what we're doing is so we want to measure F nu, which is the total energy density in neutrinos or fractional energy density in neutrinos, which is itself just what you the neutrino mass is. We actually have to measure three numbers. And so why do we have to measure three numbers? Well, we, first we measure the CMB lensing, but CMB lensing is really proportional to three quantities. It has the suppression due to neutrinos, but it also scales like just the primordial amplitude because you know if there was no primordial fluctuations, there'd be nothing to see. It also depends on the total amount of matter in the universe because if there's no matter in the universe, there'd be nothing to lens and there'd also be nothing to see. So what you observe in CMB lensing is the product of these three numbers. So if you want to isolate the last term, the suppression of neutrinos, you have to measure the first two numbers with very high, with very high accuracy and precision. So the first one, omega matter, we, we will get from the expansion of the universe. We'll measure how much matter there is because of its effect on the total expansion rate. And we'll do that by measuring the BAO, um, the, uh, like a standard ruler that comes through galaxy surveys and that we'll measure the primordial amplitude from the primary CMB, so from Planck. Um, now, how difficult it is to measure these numbers is shown in increasing difficulty as we go from the top to the bottom. So it's important, to, I'll, we'll come back to this, that this number has historically been the hardest to measure. And so um, as you think about this, the t before the data I'm about to talk about, people would have said the lensing is probably the easiest, we kind of maybe have to worry a little bit about the BAO and this primordial amplitude is probably the hardest thing. Um, and so those are, that should maybe influence what you think of what's gonna come next. Okay, so now we're ready for the data we have today. Okay, so with what I said before, everyone was expecting DESI to be the final piece of the puzzle. We had the other two pieces of data. We had the CMB lensing from Planck, we had the primordial amplitude from Planck, and all we needed was DESI to come along. DESI was going to give you the kind of final piece you needed to determine that the neutrino mass was not zero, probably around 58 milliEV, plus or minus a few sigma, but well away from zero was the general expectation. This is a figure I made in a talk three years ago. This is basically what I thought was going to happen. This is what most people would have said was going to happen when we had enough data from DESI. So DESI came out with their first 
data release after one year. Um, this is what happens when you combine CMB from Plonk with Desi BAO. Specifically, the uncertainty indeed went down by a lot. Measuring the omega matter from the CMB shrinks the error bar on the neutrino mass because that's the degeneracy that was stopping you from measuring neutrino mass. It puts an upper limit of 70 milli EV at two sigma, excluding the inverted hierarchy at two at almost three sigma, but almost also excluding 58 milli EV, which is this line here, and definitely prefers zero neutrino mass as the maximum likelihood point. This property was actually already known. Um, this is a plot taken from EBOS in 2020. There they also saw that their data preferred zero as the maximum likelihood point. And when they fit it to a Gaussian, they actually found that it would peaked at negative values. But in general, they found the constraints had kind of were generally much stronger than they would expect because the thing had looked like it shifted towards negative values. In fact, there were there were EBOS plus some other data sets that had already excluded 100 mil EV for exactly the same reason. So technically, even prior to DESI, it was known that these seem, these neutrino mass analyses had excluded the inverted hierarchy but no one was really very happy with it because they were stronger than expected. Okay, so what we wanted to do was first to, rather than extrapolating this from a fit, really include negative neutrino mass in the analysis, allow neutrino mass to go negative and find out if that is indeed what the data prefers. So we did this by basically just Ex by taking the signal what you're actually looking for, which is the suppression of power, and allow the suppression of power to become an enhancement of power. And so you basically create this new thing we're gonna call neutrino mass, which is just has this tilde M, I may not always be consistent about it. And then it has some functional form, which we've just chosen to be symmetric in the mass to minus mass. So specifically, if the suppression has a particular shape for positive neutrino mass, then it's just reflected to be an enhancement of the same shape for negative neutrino mass. As I've said, the shape of the curve doesn't really matter. So this is not an important detail, but this is just how we implemented the analysis. We also remove neutrino mass from omega matter just to free up the omega matter to not get some negative energy component. We didn't want to be putting negative energy propagating through the universe. Um, and, but we did check that this didn't significantly affect the outcome when you impose that neutrino mass is positive. So when we, when we do the analysis with this definition of neutrino mass, enforcing that it's positive, we get similar results. So this is kind of what those profiles look like. So again, this is the negative neutrino mass signal for a minus 160 milli EV neutrino, which I didn't put there by accident, but you see it's basically the same shape just reflected around uh, zero. Okay, so this is a result of our analysis. Um, this is the blue curve is our reanalysis of DESI. It agrees with what they did, but this is just to show that we can reproduce their results with physical neutrino mass. The orange curve is this fake neutrino mass constrained to be positive. It's a little bit weaker of a constraint because there's less information. So it just broadens just a little bit, but you can see it's a very similar constraint. And this green curve is what you get when you allow it to be negative. Um, and you see you get minus 160 EV, milli EV, plus or minus about 90. Is there that, is that a question? Yeah, that's right. yeah. So here you're using mm -hmm. CMB lensing as a primary observable and you injected omega matter from DESI. Is that what it did here? So CV lensing is the primary observable for sure. And I'll come back to show that, that that's really where the information is coming about for neutrino mass. And so we have just put the neutrino, we've only put this signal in, in CV lensing. So basically the only thing that's telling you about neutrino mass is the lensing signal. So we just multiplied the lensing signal by this thing. And then it's because omega matter also multiplies that that we need DESI to pin down the value of omega matter. We also heard that there's a lensing anomaly plant that when you plot the lensing amplitude, we don't get one. Is that related to what you're showing here? They, they are, they are related. I'll show you exactly. I think I know what you're, I, 
it really depends exactly what you're talking about. I know, but I'll I have a plot in a second that we'll come back to this. Okay, so what could be going on here? Okay, so, um, oh, did I get, I'm worried I'm out of order, but okay, what could be going wrong? Um, so we need to measure, um, we need to measure F nu, but we also need omega matter and AS, as I mentioned before. The most obvious thing that we were worried about is the optical depth. So the optical depth is just the rescattering of photons due to re reionization. So the universe ionizes probably around a redshift six. The photons scatter off of that. So when you see the CMB, you get this kind of frosted glass effect, which is that like on small scales, they scatter and you kind of lose some of the information. So that's this exponential suppression here. So the amplitude you see on small scales gets this little bit of exponential, but the large scale features are still there. You don't lose the large scale information. So you can see the shape of this person is still there, but you lose all the tiny details. And so the, the lensing amplitude, the one that doesn't know about the optical depth is only living on low L. So low L is where you measure the, the AS, or alternatively, you measure this combination and this combination, and therefore you learn about the optical depth from low L. They're all the same statement, but one way to say it is the number we need is only located at low L. However, but people normally report it as a statement about the optical depth. Um, oops, I got this out of order. So sorry, I, my slides got mixed up. So the history of the optical depth is this. The optical depth has been very hard to measure. Uh, there was a huge jump in between 2015 and 2018 in Planck. All of a sudden, the numbers are quite a bit lower than historical average. And anyone who is around in the early 2000s to see the first W map also knows the horrible history of the first measurement, which was way off and really high. However, so you might think the history suggests something funny is going on. The one thing to note, though, is that what you would need to explain this negative 160 is this line here, this solid line. This solid line is eight sigma away from, I think, this measurement. And so it's just a huge shift you would need. So it would have to be a giant systematic. It's not just a statistical fluctuation. Like, this is what you would need to get zero to 58, but this is what you need to get all the way from minus 160 to 58. So it's a big effect you would need and probably too large to be entirely explained by the optical depth. Okay, sorry, again, I apologize, but somehow my slides got out of order. Okay, next possibility. Desi has some funny looking points. Maybe Desi just is, is not very good and that's the problem with Desi and they'll get more data and find they're systematically wrong. The already we showed that this was there at EBOS, so you should already be skeptical that that's the explanation. You can also just swap out those points. So you take the bad points and replace them with Sloan data, and you get basically the same results. So it's probably not some DESI systematic. DESI is really playing a pretty weak role here. It's probably not DESI. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, My in my confusion, I was, okay, so, Sorry, optical depth, sorry for the mix up in the order of slides. The other thing with the optical depth is you, there were multiple measurements here. So you might say, well, you might wanna just check that it doesn't matter which measurement you take. So you can also reanalyze the data with different versions of the Planck likelihood. They shift neutrino mass around a little bit, but again, all consistent with this negative, but quite large negative value. Um, Okay, so the other thing you might say is like, maybe it's just that the BAO data has always been off. Like what if, if omega matter was just supposed to be way higher, that would accomplish the same goal. So for example, omega, higher was, omega matter was much higher than expected. You have this dash green curve, which has been chosen to kind of look like the, six, the minus 160 milliD. And you could ask if that's a plausible shift, you know, just maybe historically measurement of omega matter has been bad. And here's where we are. So DESI was a downward shift. So it is, you know, plausible that there's something going on there where it was a little bit lower than expected. But again, it's something like eight sigma. Like it's a huge shift to get this solid line is again what you would need to explain the neutrino mass signal entirely by a, by a shift of omega matter, which is really counter to the historical trend. The history has actually been pretty stable around this number 
and it's very far. Even though Desi was a little bit down, it's not down by enough to explain what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to pause here. That's where we are with the data. Does anyone have questions about the data? I I, I promise you, I think I have the comment. I thought. Well, so far you, I mean, that you already you mentioned at the beginning, you assumed that you flat lambda CDN, right? That's a lot of assumption here. Is that correct? Uh -oh. Uh, so we're about to change that assumption. So this was <laughs> the state of things where it's without any bit new physics. Okay, so now we'll talk about new physics. But then the, any other galaxy or large structure measurements see the, the scale dependent change, and that's one key feature that you should have, right? So the the there is information that will come from other data. I think the real worry you have is if that gave a different answer, would you believe the new data more than the data you already have? And I think the issue is like other measurements are less trustworthy than what I've already shown. So if they gave a discrepant answer for Omega Matter, I'd probably be, believe the matter, this measurement. Um, but that's that's up to you. <laughs> but I'm but but as a community, if someone came along and measured an Omega Matter up here using a different measurement, I don't think that they would you would oh, find I'm people are like believe it. Yep. I was going at it that there are the neutrino mass neutrino effect has a scale dependence, right? The not scale doesn't do anything, and then more than three screen scale, you suppress the power, right? And then yeah, that the, measurement is that measurement is like, going to take forever. Like that's decades away. We're not going to measure that for a very long time. Okay, thank you for sure. It's very hard. It's very hard. People have forecast it, but it's very hard. Like it's it, it, the scales are just too big. The cosmic variance kills you out there. It's really really hard. Yeah, the mass is zero. Yeah, too big. But I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> there are other scale dependent signals in BSM scenarios that are possible to look for. So there's hope in the BSM context. So I'm gonna again. I'm moving a little bit slow. So I'll get to BSM because I'm sure that's what many of you are probably excited to talk about, but I'll, I'll kind of run through some scenarios there. Um, does that work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the current situation is this. Um, we're not gonna measure the optical depth again until Lightbird launches. Again, not in a way that I would believe. So people are trying from the ground. The ground is extremely hard. You're really gonna wait to Lightbird for a believable another measurement of the optical depth. Um, I won't, the DESI Euclid data, because of this feature that basically doesn't help to change a meta, make a matter unless it's a massive change, um, more data is probably not gonna change the story with DESI. So you're probably waiting for better maps of the lensing, particularly with Simon's Observatory or CMBS4, where you get the information about polarization and upper temperature. I will come back to talk about that in a second. So what this means in practice though, is that for the foreseeable future, we're almost certainly going to be consistent with some of neutrino masses as zero and probably consistent with negative neutrino mass. And so what we should do is think about BSM and ask if there are ways to probe the alternate BSM explanations that use other data to pin down possibilities. So there are kind of two obvious things you wanna do. The first is, just explain zero. Can we get to explaining neutrino mass equals zero by erasing the positive neutrino mass signal? This strategy will put us probably in the neutrino sector because you're just trying to get rid of the thing that looks like neutrinos. The second possibility is trying to explain the negative neutrino mass. That is really an enhancement of clustering since that's something that goes in the opposite direction you really need to do something outside the neutrino sector, and this physics is really going to be non-neutrino-like. Okay, so vanishing neutrino mass. Okay, so this one is kind of obvious, so I won't go into too much detail. Just make the neutrino heaviest mass eigenstates decay. So you can add mo you can add a new scalar field, for example, like a myron that couples to the neutrinos. If it has some off-diagonal coupling in neutrino flavor space then you can take the heaviest neutrino, have it decay to a lighter neutrino emitting a massless particle. Um, you basically just need that decay rate to be between the recombination and you know, redshifts of you know, about 100, 
which leaves a pretty good re window. And it basically drops the sum of neutrinos. You can either drop it down to only the lightest or the lightest two. Either one is sufficient for our purposes. There are some very weak constraints on this that put you into, that basically say this is a good range of coupling that satisfy existing constraints on these kinds of models and would be consistent with removing the neutrino mass signal. So getting down to some neutrinos equals, um, equals zero. In fact, interestingly, the, the, um, the upper limit comes from the CMB by preserving the phase shift. So actually this is due also to cosmology. So most of what we know about neutrino decay um, in this, these kinds of models are driven by cosmology. There's a similar story with annihilation for diagonal coupling. So you just annihilate the way the neutrinos. It's basically the same story and there's a similar story about couplings. Another option, cool the neutrinos, okay? So the problem is the neutrinos are moving too fast. They don't cluster. Now, if the neutrinos had the same number density, but were just moving slower, then we would move that free streaming scale and we to higher K. And you could, if you moved it all the way to the right, then you would no longer have the suppression. And so roughly speaking, you can see that you remove the suppression on the observable scale. So this is basically an observable window. If I cool the neutrinos by a factor of 100, I can basically get rid of the suppression. Now you can do this by coupling to dark matter. Dark matter is out there. It's a nice cool bath in which to interact with the neutrinos. A good way to interact with dark matter that doesn't cause you a lot of observational problems is to go through a right-handed neutrino. So if you have a right-handed neutrino, you can couple it directly to the dark matter without being significantly constrained. However, to cool the neutrinos, you need the dark sector to have some interesting physics so that you don't just have purely elastic scattering, but you really have some way to dump the energy there. So that involves either adding dark radiation into the dark sector or just having a bunch of degenerate um, states in the dark sector. These are things that are not very well constrained because you'd be doing all of this after recombination. So you'd, the, all of the coupling, the, all of this loss of energy would happen at redshift of about 100 or below. This regime is not super strongly constrained, and so it's not that hard to make, to make this work. Okay, so those are the kind of obvious, just get rid of the neutrinos. Harder thing to do is negative neutrino mass. Okay, so one thing you might think to do is to change the expansion of the universe. Obvious thing to do is to get away from uh, constant dark energy and have dynamical dark energy. The reason you might think to do this is because the DESI initial papers were talking about their hints of dynamical dark energy that they had. So they say, then rather than talk about neutrino mass, their paper was really focused on this hint of dynamical dark energy as defined by W naught and WA. Um, now, dark energy can also change the growth function. So in particular, the way that matter grows depends on the expansion of the universe. So in particular, we know just even from Weinberg's paper from the 80s that if that, there's too much dark energy, it suppresses the growth of structure. So what you, you have some ability to change how much structure is formed by the nature of dark energy. Now it turns out that to get more clustering, what you want is that the dark energy basically becomes important later. So what you want is for Hubble to increase. So basically you need Hubble to be lower than the Lambda CDM prediction in the past so that the structure forms quicker. The problem is that this violates the null energy condition. And so if you like the null energy condition, most models that would produce negative neutrino mass from dynamical dark energy will violate that condition. However, if you just like W naught and WA, it's totally fine. There are regimes of dark W naught and WA parameter space where this does indeed work. However, the problem with this strategy is that dark energy domination is like, dark energy takes over the universe at a very low redshift, like Z of about 0.3. The lensing signal really comes from higher redshift, like one to 10. And so, here I've shown the influence on the formation of structure from dynamical dark energy. So by changing W naught, 
in P of K at Z of zero. So here you see I get this huge effect at the low, at low redshift. But here's the matter, this is the CMB lensing signal. It basically doesn't have any effect on lensing. And so the problem is that playing around with W naught and WA looks like it does something significant to P of K, but it doesn't hit the thing we actually are measuring. So you see that the lensing signal looks the same as the for neutrino mass, which is these dashed lines, but you have a dramatically different um, impact on low redshift, where low redshift means Z of zero, and CMB lensing, which really means Z of one, two, three. So you can put them all together and you can analyze the data. And because the dark energy mixes up with your omega matter, makes it harder to measure omega matter, your error bars get wider, but it doesn't absorb the preference for negative neutrino mass. The negative neutrino mass is still there. It still peaks there. It just widens the error bars. So we don't see a significant uh, removal of this preference for negative neutrino mass by adding dynamical dark energy. In addition, if you put dynamical dark energy with the constraint that satisfies the null energy condition, also sometimes called non-phantom dynamical dark energy, the, the negative, it shifts towards even more negative values. And so you actually find even stronger constraints on, neg on neutrino mass when you put in that the, you have dynamical dark energy because the full thing shifts to the left. And this was observed in previous analyses. So people had previously searched for dynamical dark energy and neutrino mass and found that the neutrino mass bounds got stronger, which is kind of peculiar because normally when you expand the model, your bounds get weaker and not stronger. And this is why, because it prefers even more negative mass. So this points to the, pos the idea that it's probably not a symptom of dark energy, that this is its own signal. Okay, so it really is, by all evidence, an issue with the lensing. And so here, this was a plot I promised earlier, which is why I'm sorry, I, I, otherwise I would rush through it, but I do want to get here. So here are the various sources of lensing and neutrino mass. So what we've done here is done different analyses where we include lensing in different ways. And I'll I'll come to explain what I mean by four-point lensing if that's not obvious. To, that's probably not obvious to most of you. Um, this curve here is when you only include, this one here is only when you include the power spectra. So I, this is usually the one that people talk about as the A lens anomaly, is that the fact that if you allow, if you just look at the effect of lensing on the primary CLs, it looks like a huge, overly large effect. So if you only use the, if you only use this primary CMB, no CMB lensing reconstruction, you get this gray curve, which wants a hugely negative neutrino mass. That is the um, what people usually talk about as the A lens anomaly. This one here includes the lending reconstruction power spectrum, which I'll explain in a second, as we usually call the four point lensing information. So here we've included when you remove this signal, so you remove the lensing anomaly by marginalizing over a lens. Um, so, and then this is the this is what you get when you remove all the lensing information. So, if you have no CMB lensing, you get this big fat error bar, and you can't say anything, as you'd expect. So, your information is really coming from CMB lensing, but the preference for negative neutrino mass is coming from the lensing reconstruction itself, and not from this smoothing of the acoustic peaks that sometimes people worry about. Okay, so perhaps in the interest of time, because I'm already five minutes over, I'm just going to quickly explain what I mean by four-point lensing and why that suggests a negative neutrino mass strategy. Um, okay, so roughly speaking, what lensing does is it generates off-diagonal correlations. So it generates correlations that in Fourier space would be forbidden by momentum conservation, or in terms of ALMs, correlates different uh, ALMs that you'd allow than normally would be allowed. And it does so proportional to the actual realization of the lensing potential. So people can use those off diagonal correlations to reconstruct the thing that's generating them in the first place. So you basically take the temperature and another temperature and you add them up, weighted by what you expect this correlation to be, and the thing you get after taking that average is the lensing potential. 
Okay, so you can reconstruct the thing that generates this, this by averaging over combinations of temperature with, that are related so that they have the same exact Fourier mode of the lensing potential. So this is what our lensing potential is. So that means that when we calculate the power spectrum of lensing, we're really calculating a four point function of temperature. And so that's why I kept saying four point information. And that's a common CMB lingo for the CMB power spectrum is it's a four point temperature power spectrum. Now, this four point temperature power spectrum is observed at 40 sigma. And what we need to explain the neutrino mass signal is a shift by about two or three sigma. So that's a pretty small tri spectrum. It's just on the border of what you can already do. So if you wanted to change the lensing potential that you reconstruct, you could just add a primordial four point function. A primordial four point function that just kind of looks roughly like the lensing one will boost this amplitude. You'll reconstruct a field, but that could be a primordial field. Like for example, the one I would get by coupling to an extra degree of freedom. It turns out that tri the space of tri-spectra is very large, and a tri-spectrum like this is very unconstrained. So there's actually very little constraint on doing it this way, and you don't really need to fine-tune the model to be that much like lensing because it's not really constrained very well. And so all you need is something that's kind of vaguely similar to this four-point function, and that would be good enough to change the, what you perceive to be the lensing amplitude, but it's that you're mixing lensing in some additional field uh, from inflation. There are lots of ways to do this that include lots of interesting physics. So here's just our favorite uh, figure of why new exciting physics during inflation can generate interesting four point functions. And so there's a lot you could imagine doing that's not very well constrained that would that would make this work. OK, again, I'm over time, so I'm just going to summarize. CMB plus BAO seems like it prefers less than or equal to zero neutrino mass. This seems like it's coming from lensing. It's not easily explained by known systematics. It's already been present in data sets before DESI, and it's likely to persist even with more data from DESI. It, cosmology is particularly sensitive to neutrino mass, so it's not easily uh, in tension with any other experiment. This is the first experiment that's really sensitive to this regime of parameters. There's lots of ways to explain the signal with BSM physics. Explaining zero is interesting physics in the neutrino sector. Negative is something else on neutrino physics, but it could be from something that makes clustering happen more quickly, long range forces, something like that. I showed one possibility, which is primordial non-Gaussianity because that's kind of fun and a separate angle, but something we could also look for. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So question time. Yeah, so here I have many questions. So, yeah, please. Hi, uh, yeah. So, I uh, just want to comment that the, the, I know this is the context, but calling Deji bad points are not, um, uh, because they, we had no reason to find that there, you know, anything is wrong with the Deji. So, I don't think it's uh, the next you know, piece of wood saying bad points. <laughs> and another thing is, although this zero well, point one appears really offset, right? It's annoying relative to the Planck lambda CDM. Actually, the, that point actually is in a fairly good agreement with SDSS. When you look at the, the previous data points, it is the other point which shows some more offset. But that point appears, although it's offset from the Planck, right? Just because our reference cosmology is Planck 2018, they are not in a really anomaly with respect to SDSS. <laughs> Um, no, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, we literally reproduced the DESI analysis. So de we just did the same thing that DESI did. So this plot here is just redoing DESI with negative neutrino mass. So our our choice to do this was not something outside of the DESI paper. And so I don't feel that we were suggesting anything you would worry about that is beyond what DESI, uh, what, what you guys did. So yes, I, but I'm quoting like, again, this is a, just what would you worry about? And my point is that regardless of what you think of these points, they are not going to shift the answer. Um, I understand that because I kind of have to jokingly saying, I could, you know, giving an impression that kind of did say, may, may raise a concern to some people that there's something. No, no, I understand. By less years, I'm just joking, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, no problem.
So I think your reference point is the ambient lens. Can, can, you, can you hold on for one second? I have to do something very quick. I'll be right back one second. So the scene is always from singular angle, right? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, good. So I think it's dinner time here. I had a small issue. <laughs> sorry. So have you tried incorporating also DS, not DSI? They, they also made a, made a lensing amplitude there by the mirror from certain amplitude, right? So you're if that goes the same set, I mean, I also remember so, that there's some tension there too. Okay, I can tell you what we're doing, which I actually, my, when I say that I don't think that this will matter at all, the reason I say that is actually we're making mock DESI data for DESI five years based on the TTT EEE CMB best fit cosmology. And we're just generating like what would DESI, like who that is consistent with the Lambda CDM that you would expect from with no lensing information, do you see anything even with that? And the answer is that you still see an issue with the lensing. And so it doesn't matter which data set, you can make up a fake data set right, right, that's designed to be consistent. What about, what about CMB lensing and DES lensing? So DES lensing, that I mean, what well, it's not as precise. So, well, one, it's just, it's, it's should not shift the values. Um, I have, we have not put the DS lensing in. They're just way wider error bars. I don't expect it to have any significance. Um, the re, like lensing reconstruction from Galaxy is just not even at the same level yet as CMB lensing. Uh, this is a 40 sigma measurement, right? We're talking about, we're talking about 1% precision on the lensing amplitude. Right, and I think that if I remember the DES lensing error bars, they're enormous. Like they're not good enough to really change the story. So I wouldn't expect that adding that, unless it was just totally discrepant. But again, I don't, I don't think it's discrepant. I don't remember it being discrepant because the error bars are so big. But I don't think that this the CMB lensing is currently more reliable and I think statistically more powerful. But mm -hmm. I can check. Yeah, I, that was my impression. Even with LSSD or Rubin, they they also have. Okay, well, so there are many quoted error bars. I will say there, everyone quotes neutrino mass. At some level, all those futures, so LSST will be good enough that if you took away the CMB, it would produce a measurement according to the Fisher matrix forecast. Now let's say, LS, let, but let's just game it up. Let's say LSST gives you a measurement that is consi that's consistent with, you know, 100 mil EV plus 100 mil EV. CMD gives you minus 160. Like that, I, the who are you more trust trusting? Unless you just want confirmation bias, right? If your confirmation bias is whoever gives me a number bigger than 58 mil EV is the one I believe, then that's one thing. But I I really do. It's to, to me, the CMB has always been, it's in the linear regime. It's the one that you worry less about systematics. It's the one that's been more developed. And so, yes, we can wait for that data. I do not think that it's going to, it will only add confusion. I don't think it'll add, it has clarifying power, but indeed it's there. Everyone, lots of experiments have promised neutrino mass measurements, but all I'm saying is that like, they will either confirm this which then we're like, what's going on? Or they'll be discrepant with it, which will also be what's going on. But I don't see them as clarifying. The one thing that could be clarifying that I emphasized was the E to B lensing. Because even in a world where what you worry about is systematics, where did I put this comment? In a world with systematics, E to B lensing is all polarization. And there is a slight worry that people, you could have about the point sources uh, between us and the CMB, the unresolved point sources. And those tend to not be very polarized, so they're less of a big deal in the E to B maps. So in principle, E to B is an even cleaner probe than the temperature reconstruction. And so if there was a big discrepancy between E to B and the T to T lensing reconstruction, because they are really literally reconstructing the same thing, then you would be like, yeah, there's something wrong. And that would be the cleanest, like it's a CMB lensing systematic. 
So this is like five to 10 years, probably similar as, as, as Ruben. But I would say that if I'm just worrying that it's systematic, if it's new physics, it could show up anywhere. But if it's like, there's a systematic in lensing, how are we gonna know? I would, the way that we would know, I believe is E, is e to B. That would be the strongest, like ever, if E to B was here and, and TT is here, like that's a pretty clean case. Like it's oh, just that's, something that's is screwed up in your tube. <laughs> yes. Okay. So we can also then get excited <laughs> about other BSM physics. But again, like I think that is the like, if it's a systematic, I think that will be one one very clean test of it, it points to something concrete and it's something the data will be coming. We do expect the E to B the E to B estimator will with CMBS four will surpass even the T to T, but E to B will be comparable to Planck you know, sooner than that. So like Simon's ish, maybe five years, we'll have E to B and, and okay, that's, that's something to look forward to. So if it's lensing, if it's CMB lensing systematics, it's five years ish. But if everyone consistently sees an issue with the lens and it was like optical depth, it was like all, this is all because the optical depth is wrong. Like, yeah, that could take 15 years and that would be, Pretty pretty scary. Um, anyway, but okay. I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but is that? Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. Is there another question? Yep. So if I understand correctly, we are here. The the role of data here is just a, a scaling down cover constant, right? So if all this feature is from CMB lensing, so even for the future. In what case can the information from future data PAO change this the, the, the implication? It, it would it would have to shift, like it would just have to be a huge shift in the omega matter. Like it would really have to be that DESI five year, where was it? Um I had it here. Uh right. It would just have to be like this point was it was supposed to be up here. That DESI mm -hmm. five year shifts omega matter to some large value that just like the one year was just way off for some reason right like so but if but but shrinking the error bar in this point will do nothing but yeah. the because right now the with desi the uncertainty is set by the optical depth so until you measure the optical depth better the error bar on on some mu will not get better it doesn't matter how much bao data you have it's no longer limited by omega matter and except if it's biased, right? So if you shrink this error bar to zero, you'll still get the exact same neutrino mass measurement. It won't change the error bar, it won't change the likelihood at all. All right, so it's really CMB. That's... Yeah, and so it's all CMB now. Like we were waiting on DESI because before DESI, it was limited by omega matter. So that's why, that's why this was the story, right? Before you had DESI, you said, we're just waiting for DESI. Desi, once we have it, everything is all we need. We're ready to measure neutrino mass because that was the one piece we didn't have. But now that we have Desi and we don't have this picture, we don't know what to do because we don't know what comes next. Yes, another question? Uh -huh. Right, very nice question. So as a BSM scenario, you already consider the change the lambda, right? Well, uh, is there any possibility to change the dark matter sector? Like even even zero mass neutrino is not enough, right? So, so uh, yeah. So what we did, so a long range force involving dark matter, we did consider this in the paper. Um, so you could add a dark, like just add a second force, like a violation of the equivalence principle in the dark sector to just make it grow faster, just a slightly stronger force. That would do it. Um, that one is actually, I'm told, so at I don't think it's officially ruled out, but I'm told that by people who have looked for equivalence principle violations in the dark sector, that they think that there's some are, there's some data that will allow them to rule that out. Um, but but that's a possibility too. Like so, I don't know. That I'm told that 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 there's a way to do that. The analyses that have been done assume that it extends over all history, and if you just focus on low redshift, you say, look. Let's say that for some reason this dark force only became important at low redshifts, then it doesn't 
technically look like it's within the cons previous constraints, but I'm told by um, Amelia, um, Emanuele Cast uh, Castellano, who's who's done some of this work, um, that that they have some, they think that they could redo their analyses just at low redshift and cover the regime of parameters that look like it would give this enhancement. But again, I don't know, there's probably ways to model build around those. No one's published that paper, so I don't even know if it's actually constrained. I've just been told that it probably is. So that's definitely something you could look into. And I also have a very nice question. Okay. Yeah, regarding the the the, the public the possibility that you uh, mentioned at the last, so that the primordial non Gaussianity may may make the lensing signature. So I naively expect that these uh, primordial non Gaussianities are very small. I what I, uh, uh, it is not detected yet, right? It's not detected. So the um, the primordial non Gaussianity that you would need is so in principle, this analysis, what they do is they have to take out the, so the tri-spectrum analyses they mostly don't do. So it's just like, there's only a few shapes that are done in tri-spectrum is much harder, but they, they already take the lensing one out. So they have to take the lensing signal and remove it. So if there's a, and that's just what they measure. So they basically take out the thing they're measuring and they, they take uh -huh. the data after that. So already, but the size we need is way below the other error bar. So it's like a very small effect. It wouldn't be visible in the CMB. Um, and in principle, you'd have to have a very high, like if you looked at a very dedicated analysis for some very particular tri-spectrum, it should be like one or two sigma shift, like, you know, maybe three-ish sigma. So not anything that would be super obvious unless it was like, you know, like it could be that it's big and you're just missing it. But the real advantage is this will show up in other places. So for example, it will show up in SphereX. Um, SphereX should reach the point that they can measure this tri-spectrum and kind of get into that ballpark. Um, however, the um, it's currently not, it would be too small to be visible with current data. So it's like future large scale structure surveys could look for this tri-spectra. And in principle, there's other ways to look for this tri-spectra because it's not totally degenerate with lensing because one is 3D and one is 2D. So there's some other things you could try to do, but currently no one has done it. And the tri-spectrum analyses are just generally really hard and Planck doesn't do almost anything. So even most of the current tri-spectrum analyses are done by people outside the collaboration for like one shape at a time. <clears throat> so it's not, it's, it's generally not as constrained as you'd think. And so it kind of like, so you, and in general, your intuition is probably that tri-spectra that influence power spectra would have to be very big. And that is true, but that's not what we're talking about. We're really talking about tri-spectra that influence tri-spectra. So we're just like our apples to apples is about the right size to be consistent with, with what we see. I see, thank you. So, is there any further questions or comments? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Thank for you the invitation. Okay, bye.